All right, good morning everyone. Today is Wednesday, April 24th, and it's another edition of the Investing Systems Trading Service Show. Welcome, and we're going to talk about a few things today and just kind of wing it. I have some charts we can look at and some different things we can talk about. One of the things that I want to start off talking about is now that we're in sort of the thick of earnings season here, I want to talk a little bit about how we close out certain stocks before they release earnings, which is something that we've discussed before, and I think by now everybody probably knows that's a good idea. So, you know, holding a stock over earnings is typically a crapshoot, and you get some that gap up real big and have positive earnings surprises and you get other ones that tank and if you're holding on to it you could lose any gains that you have and then some more and so you know over the years we've talked a lot about not holding stocks over earnings and it just makes sense and so for the purposes of our short-term swing trading system here we decided um, last earnings season so this is our second earnings season here so we decided what we would do is um, and we did this last time obviously is close any open trades that are getting ready to release earnings but the nitty-gritty of it is this okay this ENTG is re they're releasing earnings tomorrow morning before the open right let me double check that yeah earnings on 425 before the open so the way that we do it is this stock is going to get closed today ahead of earnings and we're using the opening price to close it if i'm not mistaken right jeffrey good morning jeffrey how you doing today hey bill yeah we 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 talked about this last week. Uh, we just used the uh, open price. This is for the the uh, the uh, closed trades, you know, the final registry, basically, because that's the that's the point where anybody could get out, right? Mm -hmm. this, that stock before earnings that day at the close, that stock could move higher, it could move lower, but everybody has a chance to get out around the open. So we just use that as our uh, as our uh, number that gets plugged into the system uh, as one of the as one of the uh, results. Remember, you know the the system is tracking the highest high, and we you get parabolic stops, and so we get all kinds of variations. But no, I agree with you that the 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 way we design this is that it's you know from a statistical point uh, a standpoint, uh, it's better not to risk to hold hold through earnings, and here's why. Because uh, sure, you can get stocks that gap up and you know continue to climb. And remember, that you can we can always look for re-entries too in stocks, and that's a topic of a good show. Uh, how do you how do you, how do you pick at a re-entry? Maybe we can look at a chart today even. And but uh, the one thing I wanted to say is that the risk is too great to the downside. There has been some nasty gap downs on earnings releases. I mean, really, really nasty. So nasty it could wipe out like your last you know five trades or ten trades even right i have one on the screen right now you can look at <laughs> oh yeah there you go uh so right and that got closed out yesterday by the system at the uh the open so there's an example of you know uh from a statistical standpoint you're just better off Look at, yeah, and look at look at the chart pattern ahead of earnings. I mean, this was you know this was a pretty decent looking. It had a this big run up in February and a nice sort of consolidation here. You know, geez, I could draw a trend line you know down across these highs, and then you can see the the entry and nice follow through, and it was basically up here you know pushing against hitting new highs, right? And then earnings come out after the bell yesterday. And wham, wham, look at that. This thing's down. It is actually down, what, 19, 20, almost 20%. So there's, yeah. there's the perfect example. And, you know, we had another one, Whirlpool, which, which got closed ahead of earnings too. And it had a gap up. And then you can see that, you know, it's come all the way back down. But, yeah, this, this uh, the thing about earnings season that I've noticed is that you know, this is kind of a, a little bit of an anomaly, but you will almost always see 
a few of these, <laughs> you know, you'll see, you'll see a few that, you know, tw like you say, you know, could wipe out a bunch of good trades because, you know, you're talking anywhere from 15 to 30 percent, you know, I see stocks regularly get crushed 20 percent on earnings, so. Sure, sure. Now, you know, it, here, here's, there's one, there's one exception here, and I'll give you the, the, the rule, is let's say you took a position in a stock and, you know, it's running your favor nicely, right, and you're up at around 15%, maybe you're above the target or the, you got a, a parabolic stop. And, you know, some of our, our runners go, you know, 15, 18, 20% or more, right? So it's, yeah, it's not, it's not unlikely to see a stock give you a good run like that. And so let's say you had a stock that you wanted to hold, hold for the longer term, so you're, let's just say you're up, you know, 15, 18%, you cut it in half. Now think about that. That means that you've got an 18% gain and now you stick a, you know, you can keep your stop way down there or whatever. And uh, that stock would have to gap, uh, you know, double that distance back against you. So that's the only real safe way to hold through earnings. Um, you, you follow me? So yeah, let's say you had a 15% gain, you cut in half, the stock would have to gap down 30% to, to hurt you. Yeah, well, this yeah. this is a good example because this thing, as of yesterday's close, was up 14.9%, so this ENTG. So anyway, uh, back to what I was saying before, um, just, so, you know, just so we can clarify this for everyone. Uh, here's an example like, like um, First Solar, FSLR, this one is releasing earnings tomorrow after the close. And so I'm going to say that probably 80% of companies release after the close. And so like this will be one since they're releasing after the, after the bell tomorrow, we'll close this for earnings at the open tomorrow. The only time that we close them sort of a day ahead of time is if they're going to release like like I said like the previous one we were looking at where they're actually releasing their earnings before the market opens, and so anyway it's just uh, you know I try I keep up with it when when I get to my desk in the morning on the home page the member home page what I do is I put the ticker symbols that are going to get closed that day. Um, using the opening price, right? And so you'll always you'll always be able to see, you know, even if I'm running a little bit late before the market opens or when the market opens, the symbols that are getting closed that day will appear there. So um, yeah, you know, it's pretty interesting. Some pretty this first solar has really uh, this is this has been a pretty nice trade. You know, this is one of those where if you were in this thing. Um, you know, theoretically, you would have already taken a partial profit, right? I mean, this is, we talked about this a couple of times. It gapped over the target, and then it came up here, and there was, uh, there was a parabolic stop kicked in. But it's gotten some decent follow-through. The stop's risen really nicely. And so, you know, this is this company actually has a habit of having, like, big moves on earnings sometimes it's up sometimes it's down so the pattern is kind of nice we looked at this last week the the longer term pattern kind of kind of has a really nice um bottoming pattern here so and it's it's up into like this uh little volume pocket here but anyway like i was saying you know if you took some off the table, maybe if depending on your position size or whatever, I mean, you could always hold just a little bit. Maybe you want to talk about uh, re-entry, though. You were mentioning something about that. Sure. Well, uh, the the thing is, is that once you you want to think of the trigger line as uh, you know, you're kind of a balance point or a shift point for the momentum. Okay. Uh, and so if, if price can get above that, then we look for uh, what we call an impulse move, right, on momentum. And that impulse move, uh, you, you know, stocks don't go straight up or straight down forever. They, they, make, a, they make a leg and then they kind of like level off or pull back a little bit and they make a higher leg. So, but the, the uh, trigger price is your kind of your shift point for the momentum of that stock. So the point is, is um, it's not that that's like the perfect place to buy it. It's that's where we watch 
you know, really finely tuned, you know, the bleeding edge of where we're looking for that shift point in the momentum, you know, let's say back to the upside going long, right? So uh, the point I'm trying to make is once we get past that, then a stock can continue higher for days, weeks, right, before we'd ever get any sizable pullback again. So you have, you can have multiple uh, uh, chances for add-ons or re-entries. Uh, now, let's take this one, for example. Um, and by the way, Bill, are you able to do uh, reverse colors on that or not? Or that's like the uh, bars? I, yeah, theoretically I could. You mean you change the colors of these bars? Yeah, like a, like a down bar is green and an up bar is uh, red. I could do that. I'll do that while you're uh, explaining what we're going to be looking at here. So I will change the up bars to red. Yeah, it's just a little trick. And I will change, I will the, change down the down to bar to green. green. All right, there you go. I think that worked. Yeah, and so the trick here, and you don't need anything else. You don't need any um, moving averages or any other kind of stuff. Uh, now, do me one other favor while we're we're uh, waiting okay. on the show to refresh here. Is um, give me kind of a basic trend line and here's how we want to draw this you see the lowest low there that that spike down and that would be um around the 27th right the pip, big pivot low oh okay the 27th of what month yeah right there you got it and and so of april oh okay sure that latest the latest pivot. yeah you're talking about like drawing up trend lines sort of uh across yeah the... but but use the bar right after it, not the pivot low, but the second bar. Okay. Second bar. Yeah. And uh, there you go. And that and th that basically works, right? Okay. And so what are we looking at here? All right. You got that under the all the lows. You want to run under all the lows. Anyway, so then give me a horizontal uh, bar above uh, the – what you'd be looking for is you'd be looking for – you see how on uh, – what would be like the 10th or 11th, you know, after that gap up. Yeah. yeah and give me yeah, – I need that trend line under like the 20 – the low of the 23rd, under all the lows. Okay. Up until now. All right. So what um, what you're looking for basically is – is you see how you know it was on the 10th or whatever that you kind of gapped up and then we went sideways and so what you're looking for is you're looking for your first green bar right which is a down bar by the way but it's for you visually it's like you get a green bar so this is a way to like kind of simplify it dumb it way down however you want to look at it and just go like okay i can't look for an entry until I get a green bar, right? You don't have to worry about what's up, what's down, what's moving average, nothing. So as soon as you get a, your first green bar, that's like your headlight or, or your your uh, light, your your go light. And then you go ahead and say, okay, give me like a, a, a three-day range. And you just put your, your horizontal line above that three-day range. All right? So if you do that, and what you're going to find is, and anytime you get a green bar down, it's a down bar, but anytime you get a green bar, then go ahead and just continue to look for like a three-day high range. And that's a good way, once we're past the main trigger line, or that's the momentum shift point, you can look for these types of, of setups, right? Real simple, basic, what I just described. And then you'd see on this one, you would have had an entry around what would it be about 61 and 61 25 or something is where you'd have it mm -hmm. well, this is uh are you talking about like add-on entries is that what we're, yeah well then that's what uh, we were talking add-on or okay uh, yeah okay huh. well, that's interesting. add-on or a re-entry so where's my horizontal line on the um above the highs of the bars well where do you, you didn't tell me where you wanted the horizontal line so, right, so let's go back go back so look at the 10th the big up bar right yeah. that's a it's a red bar right gotcha 
So you do nothing. The next day was a red bar, nothing. Now you get a green bar, boom, light goes on. Uh, now you put a, a, a horizontal resistance line above a three-day range. Uh -huh. right. Okay. So, and every day you'd get a th every day you'd get a green bar. Um, you just readjust the range. Okay. And I wouldn't be so picky that as soon as you see it go, like you can see that one day that kind of poked up. Mm -hmm. um, don't get, I mean, that could have popped up like right at the open and then fizzled. And so I wouldn't get real picky, you know, uh, uh, about jumping in like the second it pops above there. You could look for a close above it or watch for it to trade a little bit above it. If, you, if you're one of these traders that watches an intraday chart, you'd want to see like, you know, a five-minute chart at least closing a couple times and, and maybe putting a pivot low above that level. You follow me? And mm -hmm. then, um, but anyway, there's your little trick, right? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, you don't need any moving averages. You don't need Fibonacci's. You don't need stacan. Sure. You don't need anything like that. It's simple colors in, in a three-day range like that. So let me, let me change this back to normal because theoretically you could, if you know the, if you know the little trick, you could theoretically do it on your red bar, <laughs> right? Like the well, like the, yeah. But it, the point is, is again, it's you just we were making it super simple. Gotcha. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you have a stock that's got a series of you know green bars, and then you get a red one, and so you're looking for, like you said, the break of the three day range. And this is this is kind of a weird example because of this gap here. I mean, this is sort of an odd one anyway because of the way that it gapped over the target to begin with. So, And, of course, you know, since it's getting ready to release earnings, um, it's kind of, uh, since getting ready to release earnings tomorrow after the bell, it's probably not something that you would want to, that you'd want to jump right into anyway. So, Yeah, and here's the thing. I mean, it, it, let's say you were going to do an add-on uh, on a stock. And let's say like earnings was, uh, I mean, we could see a sizable run up today or tomorrow even still. But let's say that uh, earnings was uh, the end of the week, right? And you still had a couple of days. Remember, it's the old buy the rumor, sell the news. So we get earnings, pre-earnings pops a lot in stocks, right? Mm -hmm. So the cool thing, and this is something that I noticed, you know, long time ago when I first started trading that a lot of times during earnings seasons, we can get, it's like the perfect setup. We get a really nice setup a week or so before earnings. You get in, and then the 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 whisper numbers and stuff even give that that move of yours uh, more juice, right? And so they can literally make nice big parabolic run-ups right into the earnings day. So you might see that in this one here. Well, look at uh, look at I pulled I pulled up MRCY because I think that's what's happening here. This is a pretty interesting one because it's been. It's been kind of tame, right? It's just been sort of creeping up, creeping up, and all of a sudden, like the past few days here, it's getting basically a parabolic run-up. Now, earnings on this are on 430, which, let me look at my calendar here. 430 is like... this coming Tuesday, and so for whatever reason, um, kind of, this is this is a good example of like sort of a, a pre-earnings run-up, because this yep. thing's coming out with this earnings on Tuesday, example. and... All of a sudden, it's sort of um, it's sort of just launched, right? I'm gonna guess that this big gap up here. Um, let's see, what was that? One January 30th. That was probably the last earnings release. Huge gap up on big volume, and so it almost looks like they're anticipating, you know, anticipating good earnings. Although I've seen plenty of stocks that have like the, a really nice pre-earnings run up, and then they just hammer it when the earnings come out. <laughs> you know, so like I say, I just I just really don't trust what how a stock is going to react to earnings. And the funny thing is, like I saw this last night. I think it was Texas Instruments or something, but and there was a couple other ones, Snap, that came out. But what happens is, initially the stock will move in one direction, and then you know, sometimes during the conference call, it'll start going the other direction, and it just you know there's as as they, I guess, as people read through and parse out the earnings, or I, sh I say people, maybe algos or whatever, they make a determination on whether they should be buying or selling based on what's in the earnings report. And and so, you know, it's it's uh, I see a lot of stocks that just have really super erratic 
price moves, both up and down, percentage-wise, following the earnings release. So every now and then you'll see a bar that just like traverses, you know, weeks worth of price movement the day the earnings come out. Yeah, you know, in again, in we we, we reiterate this almost every show that a good swing trading process is to trade relatively small sizes, diversify, you know, lightly, which means three to five, eight positions around there, right? That's a lot to manage anyways. And uh, not sweat any one trade at all, right? And don't bet your hopes on any one trade. You should feel more like an accountant doing this than like a gambler at Vegas, right? Um, this should be almost kind of a boring type of a of exercise, right? You're getting in, you're moving orders around. That's how you should feel. But you're going to notice, if, and if you can do that, then uh, over time you're going to see how these stocks take off and then all of a sudden you've got really nice gains building under your belt. And uh, the trick is start off with the smallest sizes. You know, we talked uh, – was it last week we did the calculator – review I think, or was I it, think so yeah well uh, the past couple of weeks yeah it was it was either last week or the week before and the point is is that yeah uh, you can start off at really small sizes you won't sweat anything you won't lose any sleep uh, easing your nerves and over over time and over the series you build size and down the road you're going to be trading large large size it, and because you ramped yourself up there gradually you won't feel any difference right yeah oh yeah yeah well here's here's another sort of dynamic part of the whole system that's really been dawning on me over the past few weeks is is uh, and we talked about this too but how it the system is weeding out the stocks that don't get follow through by you know by virtue of they're getting stopped out you know with like two or three percent stop outs and what i noticed last night when we did the update is literally every single open trade here look on the open trades list i have them sorted by percent gain but down at the very bottom there's not th this one this one was just actually just got opened yesterday as of yesterday it had literally like you know it was unchanged but the the crazy thing is that every open trade is a positive <laughs> right like like they're all they're all in the positive even even these ones that haven't moved very much but you can see up at the top of the list that there's you know some some significant gainers up there but the crazy thing about it is that you know, we had like a string of small stop outs when the market was getting a little flaky there. And um, and so it's it's like weeding out, the, it weeds out the stocks that don't get the big follow through. And then the stocks that do actually go on to perform, they stay in the open trades table, right? Yeah, cut your, cut your losers quickly and let your winners run, the old maxim. And that's what the system automatically does for you if you just go through the motions and don't think about it too much. So, um, and, and again, you know, I think, I think a few weeks ago we, when we were in the market doldrums a little bit there, you will see string, uh, strings of, of stop outs, but they're all relatively small compared to what you can see on the gains. Right. Um, and that's why you, it's, it's very difficult to be like a super scalper swing trader, right? Because, um, then you've got to have a really high win rate all the time on your trades, right? You got to be hitting those really tight, you know. And I'm talking not even our target. Our targets, a, 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 our target is a decent, healthy target. That's not a scalp target uh, uh, at all. Um, I'm talking like you know, if you just go for like one percent or two percent or something like that, um, you're going to find that you're going to hit stretches where you cannot have a winning edge for a while you know what i'm saying uh yeah let's say you took th three stop outs you know relatively small stop outs and you had one big winner that would that cancels out all the stop outs see that's how it, it's designed to work 
Sure, sure. And yeah. something like something like this MRCY that I have up on the screen here, you can see how it, you know it it poked at the target a f couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago actually, and then it's actually like really launched off of that. And so percentage wise, this thing is uh, well, actually this is the this is the biggest gainer in there. I just happened to so it was uh, it was up nineteen point seven percent as of yesterday's close. And uh, it's up another, you know, percent and a quarter this morning. So, it, you know, another interesting thing about this is how the parabolic stops, the parabolic stops hadn't kicked in because of sort of the smoothness of this this rise, which nothing really to sneeze at. I mean, I was like ten, that was like ten percent up to the target or whatever. But but now that the stock is actually going parabolic, what it's doing, I'm I'm noticing is like the parabolic stop is going right under sort of the previous day. That's something else interesting that I mean maybe we'll have to. I, I didn't really do much prep, so maybe one day we'll have to do a show kind of devoted to the parabolic stops. But I looked through a few of them, and what I noticed is that you know it'll set a parabolic stop like under a long range day like this. And then one like this, and then say that it closed right here, that parabolic stop would stay right there, right? And say you had a couple of narrow range days or whatever that didn't hit it, it's just going to stay right there. Only, and this is just something I noticed, maybe you can shed a little extra light on this, but only if like there was another big sort of move up would the next parabolic stop kick in. Well, uh, yeah, maybe um, the the. The parabolic stops, there's, if I remember correctly, there's two different types of triggers for that uh, that can get, get you a parabolic stop. And those aren't really based on the bars or stochastics or anything like that. Um, I, I've come up with a couple little quanted out formulaic uh, uh, type of things that uh, when they basically, when the numbers trigger, we have a high ratio of either that's where the stock's going to stall and move sideways, or that's where it's going to kerplunk, right? Uh, like sometimes stocks will shoot up for three days, and then you get like one big down day that just cuts back through all of them. We've seen that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what the parabolic stop is designed to potentially alert you to, right? Mm -hmm. And again, um, you can utilize these in lots of different ways. You get a parabolic stop, you move this the, uh, the, your initial stop all the way up there to, to lock in profits on the whole trade. Or you can use it to take profits on half. Um, so uh, like this example here, that parabolic stop at uh, 7105, we could see the stock you know move up for several more days above that, right? So um, but that's just a protection level. Think of it as a protection level. Hmm, interesting, interesting. So, I suppose. Yeah, and it has to do with how fast. It has to do with how fast the stock moves, right? So we call it a parabolic stop. When the when price just goes like through the roof, um, it a lot. You know, the 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 risk increases that it's it's going to stall and come back. Yeah, we've seen. Um, let's see. Oh, I know what I was going to talk about is so this is another interesting one. This uh, this R U N here. This is another one that has had a couple of parabolic stops kick in that haven't been touched yet, right? And so I I see that frequently. Sometimes I see the parabolic stop kick in, and then like a couple of days later, you know, maybe the the lows. You, I mean, you'll poke at it. You'll actually hit that stop. And so let me let me ask you this. Um, we'll just use this R U N as an example. So say you get in somewhere around the trigger, a little bit above it, you know, maybe maybe you just bought the next day after the open there, and you get this run up, and on this particular one, the parabolic stop actually kicked in before it hit the target, and on others, I see the parabolic stop kick in after it hits the target. So my question would be, and I know that this is probably up to the individual how they want to play it, by looking at the chart maybe, but... Would you would you have um, said okay you know I'm either on this day right here would you have the the following day would you have sold partial position if it hit the parabolic stop before it hits the target 
I mean, is that is that sort of a viable thing? If you see the parabolic stop kick in before it hits the target, would you say, okay, that's probably a good place to to protect some of my gains? Uh, well, sure. When I originally was designing this, and you know, again, every piece of logic in the system, and there's, you know, we've talked about this in previous shows where the trailing stop has got like five different ways it can decide to move and. Uh, that type of thing. Every piece of logic has been quanted out for its statistical, you know, value. Okay. And I originally was uh, thinking that I would only have the parabolic stops kick in after uh, the price was able to get above the targets, right? Because that's when things, you know, you hit it, you hit the target, maybe you take half and then, then if the stock was parabolic, but this is, this is a little bit more useful because it gives you an opportunity when you if and we see this a lot stocks will run up kind of parabolically into the target uh but they haven't touched it yet and then you get a parabolic stop kick in and that allows you to then go ahead and kind of bracket the price right mm -hmm. it's a win-win you get a stop up underneath the price action at the parabolic stop and you have your target like your exit like right above now you're bracketed you can't lose right unless there was a gap down uh but uh that's the idea yeah so at the time at the time of this parabolic stop which kicked in at the close on this particular day the actual trailing, trailing stop was still way down here at 1490 but you got this parabolic stop at 1560 and of course the price that day was had closed at uh, 1608 and was right up against basically right up against the target so what you're saying is is that you you would have basically ignored the trailing stop and slid it all the way up to the parabolic stop, say on half the position, right? Sure. I mean, that's exactly what you could do. Um, because, uh, and again, here's the thing. Now, when you first start off, and if you're doing, you know, relatively, you know, really small positions, let's say, to start off, uh, then, and, and again, don't fret about the money. Think percentages, okay? Forget about the money you're making. In the beginning, you you know, you might not be hardly making any money based because your positions are so small, right? You could take 10 trades and you go, oh, I made 40 bucks, big deal. <laughs> uh, but it's not about the money. Get away from thinking about the money. Think percentages. And you want to look at what is your net percent gain, you know, after, let's say after you did 10 trades, what is your net percent gain on the money you traded not on your whole account mm -hmm. right because let's say you had twenty thousand dollars but you're starting off with teeny tiny little risk levels like i constantly preach then that that's a meaningless number but if you analyze the percent gains on the money employed right in your trades that's what you want to work off of uh so the point being is when you first start off Breaking stuff up, you know, might seem like a, a, a useless exercise because, like, what's the point, right? But again, trade like you want – trade the model uh, that you are expecting to use over the long term and don't worry about the cash you're making. Worry about the percents and get the mechanics down is the point. Gotcha, gotcha. There was one – I'm trying to think. Was It wasn't this one. It was um, – let's see. I got another one. Another open one. Well, any of these, really, quite frankly, managing the stops uh, on a lot of these, there's actually there's actually stops like in between what I have marked on the chart. I see some of them that this is probably a fairly decent example. This is one I think where where I didn't I couldn't even squeeze the trailing stops on the chart. Look at how this thing launched. Right. And this is this goes back to sort of, you know, the whole you know there's, there's a lot of moving parts to the system but this goes back to the whole thing about you know weeding out the the losers what i've noticed is that sometimes we get triggered in and the stock kind of grinds around and the uh you know there's, there's different scenarios one is like a full stop out where it just it triggers in, doesn't do anything for a few days, and then just reverses and hits the full stop. Those are relatively rare, and what I find more often is that we get at least one or two stop moves in, and then sometimes it will fail, 
right, and go back and hit a stop that was moved up. And those are typically the ones that, you know, are down like, you know, 2.5 or 2.9 percent or whatever. And then you get ones like this. They just they just take off. They just launch. Right. And those are the ones that stay as open trades. And then what I've noticed is that the stop literally moves on a daily basis. The trailing stop. I mean, every single night after we do the update, that stop gets ratcheted up. Sometimes it's just a little bit, you know, sometimes it's fairly significant. But like you were like going back to saying about getting the mechanics down, man, if you had six open positions and, you know, obviously the ones that get stopped out are getting weeded out real quick. And so theoretically, you know, your open positions will typically be these ones where managing the stops is actually, you know, going to take a few minutes, right? And log into your broker and just uh, and just basically change the stop. I mean, it's, it's so easy, though. You know, you set the initial stop and then changing that to the trailing stop is pretty easy to do it only takes a second but if you've got you know six open positions it's it's a little bit of work because it is going to change on sort of on a daily basis yeah here's uh, i mean here's a recommendation for for everybody uh yeah it, it, you can make this as easy or as hard as you want and most of your platforms you can uh, there's multiple ways to change your trailing stops right you want to use trailing stops good till canceled and then all you do is get in and modify them and there's multiple ways to do that one is a lot of the platforms have a opens uh, open trade grid right where you have all your open positions just in a like a spreadsheet grid and there's a little button on each one that says modify and all you do is click on it and change the price right boom the other is that uh, a lot of the platforms now have chart traders, right? Where you actually have your, there's a, like a line right at the stop mm -hmm. on your chart. So you can have an individual chart, make an individual chart for each one of your positions, right? And all you do is just go in like, you know, train slide monkey and slide that line up and boom, that's it. It's that simple. So yeah, moving the stops is a piece of cake. Yeah, I had somebody send me a question earlier in the week. Um, you know, most, well, all the brokers now, they've, they've made stops, like, really super complicated. There's, like, all these different choices where you can have, like, a stop limit, and it asks you for, it asks you for, like, you know, the stop price, and then what you're willing to, you know, the, I guess the least you're willing to take for it, right? Um, and so the problem with that is if it doesn't trade at your exact stop limit price, then it doesn't sell you. And so, you know, just sort of by the nature of the way that stocks trade these days, you really want to just use the simple stop market, right? And so, I mean, worst case scenario with a stop market and typically with, you know, these stocks that have decent volume, we, we only trade stocks that have fairly decent volume. You might get, you know, it might sell you at a dime or a quarter less than your stop, but if you use a stop limit, it can run past your stop and keep going and never sell you out. So you got to be careful about that. Sure. Yeah, I would uh, get get in your head to use a uh, limit order on your entries if you can, and a you know stop market on your exits. That's going to work perfectly fine, right? Uh, you know. Uh, Again, if you're just sitting there watching the screen and you see the bid and ask and all that, and you go, okay, market order, boom, that's fine. Uh, don't worry about a few pennies this way or that way. Uh, if you're uh, looking to take an entry at a certain price, you can use this buy stop uh, limit order and then go on your merry way to work or get on the freeway or whatever you have to do, and uh, it'll just fill you if the price gets hit let's say you know if the price is moving up mm -hmm. but you hit the nail on the head right uh, you always want to use a, uh, a, a stop market the the analogy I've used for years is you know if you're in a burning building you don't get too picky about which window you jump out of right? <laughs> huh, interesting. I mean you might if there's yeah. a window that's got like a spiked fence below you might go ooh, I'm gonna but yeah if you're in a burning building and you got a chance to jump out a window you just kind of jump and that's the way to think about it uh, about your stops sure, now, yeah. the, the way to use a limit order on a exit though is let's say that you have a trailing stop um, and then let's say intraday because you can put your limit exits and your trailing stops now on 
I don't know of a platform that doesn't let you do that anymore. Uh, so you have both in, right? You have your 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 limit exit and your market uh, stop market. Sure, sure. And one cancels the other. Yeah, yeah. This um, I wanted to. I was just wanted to real quick look at a couple. I was talking about examples of this would be an example of a full stop out. This LTM that I have here. I was just going to look at a couple of the more recent closed trades here. Um, interest. What's interesting about this? Um, it was 55 cents, right? Which, you know, hey, it's 5% on this particular stock. But this is this is an example of, and, and this particular stock, you know, had a fairly decent pattern of like, you know, once it sort of makes a pivot low, it tends to move up and have a pretty good, pretty good run back towards the prior high. But this past time here, it had the pivot low, started to move up, just didn't get any follow through, clanged around. That's an example of like a full stop out, right? And that means that the initial stop never had a chance to get moved up. There just, there wasn't enough price action momentum in this particular stock. Let's see, here's another one. RNG, um, this is kind of a wacky one, and you'll you'll see this. I've basically, you know, now that we've had this system running since the beginning of the year, I've literally seen every single type of of uh, situation that can arise. This one's a little maddening, but again, you know, we're talking. This is a 3.9 percent. This is a weird one because it like it triggered in and then it came down and tagged that full stop you know, sort of on an intraday basis, and then look at it, just took off, right? Yeah, and, and so and this is, um, I wrote a blog post, and I know you read this blog post, but you guys that, if um, if anybody's watching the show, pop over to the blog later on today after the show and read the latest post that I made. It's kind of interesting, and this kind of reminds me of the concept of it, is that, you know, what happens is, People get into a trade like this, and they get they get stopped out, like on one of these sort of intraday things, and then the stock takes off, and so they think, oh man, you know, maybe I shouldn't be using stop losses. I'll just wing it, and then you know, the all the very next trade, you you fail to use a stop, and it just keeps going down. And so this is just one of the examples of you know how stops can can you know work against you but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that you want to change your strategy right to ditch them yeah let me make a couple of points on that because it's real important um a uh, stops are a necessary evil is the way i put it um we've got to have stops it's the only thing that can prevent catastrophic loss it's like having a lifeboat on a ocean liner right sure. you know maybe it takes up a lot of space and all that but you gotta have that sucker uh, the other thing to think about is, remember, we're going to have, we're going to get all kinds of flavors of follow through. Uh, it's not just, you know, up or down, that type of thing. We get all kinds of different patterns around the entry point. Uh, I get uh, one of the shows we covered, I think all the different possibilities, but, you know, don't think like just up or down. There's probably 10 different flavors of follow through that you'll see. And so don't try to second guess the system and think like, oh, yeah, like you just gave an example, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, I got a couple that's hit my stop, so I'm not going to use a stop anymore. No, because in the design of the system over years, all this stuff has been quanted out to work statistically over the series. So the system, are, I'll just tell you right now, the system over the series knows better than you. Right. Knows <laughs> yeah, better than me. Sense, Knows yeah. better than me. All I did was, you know, I didn't make this stuff up. I quanted it out over data, long periods of data. And so the point being is that, uh, again, uh, get away from focusing too much on any one trade. Now, there is there's two ways to swing trade. And, you know, one is to like be more of the gambler type where you go, you want to focus on one trade and bet large okay that can work because you've got a you've got a plethora of good high octane stocks that just continually come through the system and doing that you're gonna you're gonna you know just by dumb luck you're gonna land you land yourself and pick some of the ones that really move good in your favor but you're gonna take some stop outs too so realize if you choose that methodology you could hit a string of 
of, uh, of losers, backs. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, called you know a, a, a losing streak. You just got to keep that in mind. If you diversify, then what you're doing is you're you're getting a mix of winners and losers sometimes at the same time, and they kind of average and hedge themselves out. So that's where it's a little bit easier on your nerves, right? You're not going to make big bundles like over, you know, in two, three day stretches, uh, like a gambler, you're going to kind of spread things out a little bit and, 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 uh, you know, hedge things out over, over the series and over the number of positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one I have on the screen, this is, uh, I was just going down the list of the closed trades. This is, this is an example of one that triggered in, got a little bit of follow through enough for the stop to actually get raised up and then sort of came down and tagged that stop, (laughs) right? Which is going to happen, but again, you know, it's a couple of percent, no big deal. And the idea is that the ones that that don't get the big follow-through, they get closed out quickly, hopefully for a small, insignificant loss, and then the ones that stay open, well, they continue to to, uh, run, like no uh, pun intended here. One of the one of the big ways that swing traders and investors blow their accounts and blow their system is they let one trade get away from them, right? The genie gets out of the bottle, and uh, a small stop turns into a major loss. You know, uh, you could you can have a trade where it could be a couple hundred dollar stop out. You didn't take the stop, and months later, it's a five thousand dollar drawdown, and that money's been tied up the whole time. So, you know, quick stops are good stops. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, the thing about it is that sometimes stocks they 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 pull back, and then they never ever come back, right? And you could be sitting on that stock for months or even even years. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stocks that have never recovered from the big sell-offs, and the indexes are kind of weird. Speaking of the indexes, let's take a look at the S&P here. We hadn't talked about the overall market today. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement on Wall Street now because yesterday the S&P actually had a new all-time closing high. Uh, This is kind of interesting because I kind of look at zones. I mean, you know, it's on CNBC. They love to make a big deal about a new closing high in that. But um, we're in an interesting spot here on the S&P. You know, we had this in in the fall from from the all time high in September down to the very low there around Christmas time. That was just a shade over 20 percent. Which is kind of funny. Um, I did the calculations, right? This is easy to do with the calculators, which is kind of fun. Like I go to the calculators page, and like I literally calculated the all-time intraday high here, which was, which was on 9:21, the the uh, 29:40.91. You can see we're still below that, but from there all the way to like the very low intraday low was like. 20 point something percent i forget but it was over 20 percent which you know a classic um like sort of the the uh, classic definition of a bear market right is is um a drop a pullback of over 20 percent and so what's funny about this is like literally the the bear there was a bear market that lasted half a day on christmas eve <laughs> right <laughs> funny yeah, yeah. On, on christmas it was like the shortest bear market in history because on christmas eve the market was down over 20 percent for half a day trading and then and now you know we're looking at like this is about a 25 percent gain off of the low somewhere between 24 and 25 percent so so the market dropped 20 percent and then went up 24 percent and now everybody seems to the conventional wisdom just because of the the, sort of the magnitude and duration of this latest move higher the conventional wisdom is nothing can stop this market it's going to you know it might run into some resistance here but it's going to push through this and just keep on going <laughs> you know that well we're to supposed to have a, a i mean this earnings season looks pretty positive right yeah. everything i've seen about uh what they're saying about this earnings season is it could be pretty positive so um you know seeing the market continue higher is not unreasonable at all yeah, it's just amazing. Um, and here's the other interesting thing is this peak back in the end of January in 2018, 
I did the math on that too the other day, and like literally, um, this is like what about a 14 month stretch here? The market's really only up you know, like one one point two or one point five percent since that January peak back there. So that's kind of interesting. It just goes not that anybody would have actually bought at these peaks, but it's been kind of a wild ride. I mean the overall market has been on sort of a wild ride and depending on you know, depending on where you start and and, and, stop, and stop, the percentages vary tremendously. It's hard to imagine after sort of a 24% straight up move that that there's not some consolidation on the horizon. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Another interesting thing is the, is the Dow. The Dow sort of got a um, more of a level here. Let me just put a zone right there. The Dow's got so, sort of more of like sort of a triple, I won't say a triple top, but let me go to a weekly chart there. There you go. It, when the Dow gets up to this level here, it tends to sort of stall, it's stalled out the past couple of times. Let's pull up the Dow Jones. There we go. Yeah, if we drop uh, from here, then, then we will have a triple top. Yeah. Uh, is there such is thing, there thing, as, a thing as a triple top? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. As a matter of fact, a, a, a triple top, if we have a major market uh, triple top uh, and we sell back down, that is a, that's a pretty good signal that uh, the market does want to go lower because it's tried three times to get above the same level and, they, you know, three times a charm type of thing, right? So if it can't make it, it usually bombs. But, but uh, on the other hand, the, 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 technical wisdom is the third try if we bust that can you know be the one that works so we're right there yeah the sure. markets are right at that point the russell 2000 is a long way from the highs last summer and so that's a little bit that's a little bit concerning you know you got the s&p at a new high you got the dow right up there at that previous level and yet you have this like funky little pattern here in the Russell 2000 where it's it's just barely managed to to come up to this level you know the initial sort of drop this this kind of led the market right the other indexes didn't start selling off until September but the Russell peaked in August and started selling down a little bit and it's just it's just interesting to see the divergence in the different the different indexes i mean this one this one of course is 2000 stocks right and so you can see how it's struggling compared to the other indexes and even more interesting is the Qs, right the nasdaq 100 it broke out of you know it broke out of like sort of this this little double top from last year and it's it's really sort of pushed through that now the funny thing is that i think i mentioned this last week or you know whenever was that the nasdaq 100 literally like four stocks make up 30 percent of this and so that's always kind of funky you know it's kind of like the dow being price weighted and so i you know i'm not sure what to really make of it because the russell 2000 which is the broadest of all of them right in the it's a, it's 2000 stocks compared to 100 or 500 even or whatever but the Russell 2000 has typically been sort of the index that reflects you know how much um how much like risk on how much risk appetite there is like when the Russell 2000 is powering higher um the smaller stocks are doing well and that means that, you know, there's a lot of risk appetite out there and a lot of money sort of coming into the market. So, hey, you know, we go through these long term market cycles and typically the large cap, big cap, you know, well-known names are the ones that I guess the institutions favor. And that's all I can say to account for it. Yeah, trying to um, kind of 
integrate and digest all of the markets and you know remember we got all kinds of world markets and stuff too and then you got different markets like oil and gold and and they and the and the different um, currency markets all it's all intertwined and so it can get um, a little mind bending try to trying to figure it all out it'd be interesting though to take like all the US equity markets and attempt to kind of merge them into one chart um, I've I've done stuff like that way in the past where I had kind of like a bigger I like I made my own indexes and, and built my own charts off of them program that kind of stuff but uh, are you familiar with anything like that now well yeah there's the um, and I'm trying to think of it the Vanguard total market index and oh yeah and, um, is that, yeah, it's, uh, well, that symbol? Uh, usually uh, oh I know what it is it's uh <laughs> it was on the tip of my tongue the V, is it V T V T Y? It's V T. To, well, that's total world. V T I. That's what I think it is. There we go. Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF. And so this is this is theoretically the entire universe of stocks. Oh yeah. See now that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and it, um, it's not made a new high yet. And I, I'm going to guess that it's probably equally weighted. I don't know for certain. I mean, I'd actually have to look that up. But, you know, the the weighting of the Dow, and what's amazing about the Dow, and I've, I've seen this, like, I've read articles about this, that the correlation between, like, the Dow and the S&P, even though the Dow is price-weighted, which means that, you know, the most expensive stocks have the most weight, which just seems really funky, but the correlation is really good, which is pretty amazing that, you know, the way that these things are constructed, that they would have such a good correlation, but they do. Anyway, the VTI, this is the total stock market, um, U.S. stock market, I should say. So that's like every, they got to have some kind of limit. They don't include penny stocks, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's like it's got to be over like a certain amount of money. That'll yeah, be a good one to Google. Yeah. After the show, and another weird thing. Um, I mean, a couple weird things about you know our current environment as opposed to you know previous environments. You know, some of us have been doing this for you know twenty something years. Uh, there's a lot less. There's a lot less stocks out there than there used to be. Right? There there used to be a lot more public companies, and through like mergers and companies going private and all this stuff. Um, I think I saw a while back that. That the Wilshire 5000, right? That was supposed to be a, another really super broad market index. That there's there's not even that many public companies that that doesn't have 5000 stocks in it anymore, right? And so, and then you got this whole thing where you know companies are buying back their stocks and all this kind of stuff. So well, and you know, stuff. hasn't the IPR IPO market kind of slowed down also? Oh yeah, it's it's starting. Like it used to, to be. It's starting to heat back up a little bit, but yeah, over the past few years, it's it's like really, really down from you know previous market cycles. So we're in kind of a really strange, strange sort of environment. But the good news, and well, even the even good with, news, there's still way plenty of stocks. To well, try. yeah, and and the other the good news I was about to say is that there's you know plenty of individual stocks that that are doing great and having good patterns, and of course you know there's there's a uh, pockets of weakness the biotech stocks got hammered here recently but before we wrap up the show last thing i wanted to look at was this stock that's just like triggering today and i was going through the i was going through the stocks that were triggering and this one sort of caught my eye just because it's um it's a real good example of sort of how you know how our system finds a stock that's had a in a primary uptrend, right, a, de a decent short-term uptrend, real nice sort of orderly pullback, and looks like it's just beginning to make the turn. And so, what do you think of this one? You think it looks good? Now, of course, when I, you know, when I try and pick and choose, that doesn't always necessarily mean that, you know, that this is going to be any better than any of the other ones that triggered. But yeah, I just kind of... You might, you might jinx it. <laughs> yeah, I might jinx it, but I just, you know, I... Being a market technician for all these years and going through, you know, so many chart, you know, something like this, and obviously, you know, this one could fail, but yeah, this it, just kind of catches a, my eye. Sure, it had a nice orderly pullback. You got a trend line break. Um, you got a nice pivot low put in. 
It doesn't really get any better than that. And look, do me a favor, put a horizontal line across your chart just below the most recent pivot low. Okay. No, horizontal line. Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. All right. And, uh, yeah, we're a little, little delay here on what I'm looking at. Uh, the thing I was going to mention is that the other cool thing, look at how that most recent pivot lines up with that last level of resistance, right? If you go back to, what is that, May, uh, March, you know, the fourth area. Mm -hmm. And even if you go back further, you can see that same level. You can see there was that pivot high way back then. So these are what we call confluences, confluence, right, where uh, you have that most recent pivot. So the point I'm trying to make is that's a that's a good stock. There's a good area for that stock to want to turn around, and it's got a lot of good support below there. You can see it on the chart. And now, uh, one final thing I'll mention is that you know, uh, commercial airline pilots uh, a lot of times they got to just fly on instrument, right? Because they're up in the dark, in the clouds and storms, and right, and they're just flying on instruments. You could literally trade this system and never even look at a chart. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, you could. It's super easy. Uh, I don't. I mean, being a being a, 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 ch a technician and all that, you probably want to look at your charts. But you can literally just take the numbers and and the next day, if the stock's trading above that level, you compute your position sizes. You take the entries and place your stops. Uh, you know, you could trade this system for a year and never look at a chart. So the point being is that um, again. Everything works out over the series, right? Mm -hmm. Don't pick the farm on one trade. Let it. You got to take lots of trades, and they they just work out. Yeah, I actually, I have. Uh, before we go, I have a new user question here for you, and I know we've probably covered this on previous shows, but if somebody, if somebody just just gets in here. They've got uh, there's a lot of previous shows, and so real quick, let's go over this again. Um, Jim wants to know, would it be possible to th that we could discuss how to settle on an entry price after a stock triggers? For instance, if you're not able to buy shares within a percent or two of the trigger price, but there's great upward movement, would you still go ahead and buy at the higher price? And so that goes back to, let me see, there's another one that's triggering today. Another one that's triggering today, this PTLA. This is this might be well. This might be this a might decent be a example. I don't know. Um, I don't know offhand like a really good example. Maybe a couple we looked at where, where basically the stock you know closes like a couple of percent above the trigger price. You know, say several percent, and then mm -hmm. the next morning gaps up. Um, sure. Well, think of it. There's two. There's again. I mentioned earlier in the show that get away from thinking that. Um, the trigger price is like the, the system is recommending as a buy price. It's that is a uh, a trade barrier, right? That the system develops, and then when price can pop above it, that's basically just our first hint that the momentum it wants to shift back to the upside. That's all mm -hmm. it means, and then we can take an entry where we want to. Uh, now, you since that's like the bleeding, bleeding edge of the turn. If you can get an entry super close, that's great, right? That's as good as it gets. Like you're right there uh, on the bleeding edge. If you do get a gap up though, and this, and maybe a couple days even, it's it's climbing higher. Uh, what I recommend on that is if you want in that stock, then do do a half position, right? Yep. Because remember that the whole concept is that. We, we'd like trades to go in our favor as quickly as possible. If the trigger, the final trigger price where the stock, you know, closes above, if that's considered like, you know, potentially the exact turning point, we'd like to be in as close as possible. However, that's just the, 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 the launch of the impulse move. Remember, stocks could go 15, 20, 25 percent past there. So it's not like you, it's critical you got to get into the penny there. So if you do find yourself in the situation, and this is exactly how I trade, if if you get a gap that looks a little bit above where you know the trigger was, just you can take your first entry on half, and if the stock trades back down to closer to the uh, 
the trigger level, you know, over the coming days, you can say, okay, I'll go ahead and like complete the, the full position. That's yeah, the be- that's the only way you can deal with that. Sure, sure. That and that makes sense. We had, last week we actually yeah. discussed the idea of uh, one of the members said that his little strategy was he was pl- he was placing a limit order literally at the trigger price, and on some of them he was getting filled, and on some of them he wasn't getting filled. And so what you just described there, like you know this this would be a great example, right? So this morning when the stock opened you thought okay i'm just going to go ahead and pull the trigger trigger. on half the position and then i'll set a limit order at the trigger price let's see 35 25 the low yeah so this one would have got picked up here in that particular case like setting a limit order at the trigger price the following day Mm -hmm. um and so yeah uh let me ask you this would if you're going to if you're going to like pick sort of a strategy like that would you stick to that or would you say that it could it could be like a case by case basis i mean that's that's always the trickiest thing you I mean, mean using a limit order at the trigger yeah yeah well you know the the issue there and it's not even a big issue uh is that the, you might you might have lots of good stocks that take off and run and you watch them and you never got filled right but again if you get away from the focusing in you know the hope about every single trade you're taking uh, and worrying about the the sizes and the stops and all that if you try to divorce yourself from that and get more mechanical then you could literally just place orders for every stock that triggers and not even worry about it right some of them are gonna enough of them will fill and take off in your favor to make the system still work yeah, this first solar, this is an example of like this particular day it closed above the trigger and then the very next day it, it gapped up and it just never, it never looked back. And so, and so the idea is that if you had a limit order at the trigger the following day, you would not have gotten picked up. And we see lots of these too, right? So it's kind of, um, so yeah, I mean, depending on, depending on, you know, what kind of size you're using and how many positions in that, uh, I honestly think over the years, the one sort of, the one sort of thing that I think really gives a swing trader or a trader an advantage is, is like, at least splitting splitting their position up especially on an exit into at least two exits right like it's not an all or nothing thing and so with the entry it can be the same thing like you know like not necessarily buying lump sum all at once and i know it's a little you know it's a little inconvenient or tricky in that but it really as far as like the psychology of splitting your buys and your sells into two different positions it really sort of gives you you know added flexibility with with the trading and psychologically you know you're not all in or all out and so you know like if you if you bought half a position just at the open on this one and you never got picked up at the at the actual trigger price on the second half of the position you're still in <laughs> right and so and you're so you're feeling pretty good about it even though your position size is only half of what maybe you intended to go in with sure and remember we just, we talked about at the beginning of this show that you can actually do add-ons later so even if you didn't let's say you took a half a position to start and then you put a limit order at the trigger on the other and you didn't get filled you might have an opportunity a week later to add in again it all depends on you know size your position sizes what you're doing basically is you're buying like little bits of insurance in a hedging in, a, in the with a hedging concept but it requires a little bit more work right you're going to be taking more orders and you're going to be paying a little bit more commissions uh, and again that makes sense as your size starts to really really build uh, if you're just starting off, if you've never swing traded before and you're just starting off at the smallest sizes, you can just keep it super simple and, and do the you know one, one entry, one exit type of thing. And as you build, become more of your own little personal hedge fund and you can start playing how the professionals play, breaking things up, scaling in, scaling out. So this PTLA is not coming out with earnings until five eight. So that's going to be that. That gives us a little bit of time for this one. This is a this is a fairly. What I like about this is this previous run that it had. It sort of had like that you know that spike low pivot low reversal, and then just shot up 
like sort of straight up and it's kind of doing the same thing now um and so that's kind of interesting the target target looks achievable and earnings aren't a lot here so all right well let's go ahead and wrap this up we want a little bit extra today so i want to thank everybody for tuning into the show and obviously if you have any questions or comments feel free to shoot those through and at your convenience go check out the most recent blog post that i did i think i posted it last weekend pretty interesting i think you'll like it and uh thanks for coming on the show jeffrey we will see you next time very good see you next week